Who do we turn to when the ones saddled with the responsibility of protecting us do not? Is it justice to have them go through the harshness and fears they perpetrated? Well, that is an answer only you will answer. These three police officers, presumed to be protectors of lives and properties, chose to be on history's bad side. Conversely, they were molested and killed. Their end? That was total annihilation of their careers and lives. Here is the story of three corrupt cops instantly killed in jail as they pay the price for their crimes. Theodore Dyer. When Susan, victim name withheld, and her nine-year-old daughter moved into a Grand Haven apartment in Ottawa County in April 2012, they could never have known that next door to them was evil personified, former Muskegon County Airport police officer Theodore Dyer. Apart from being a law enforcement agent, Dyer was well into his 60s and had a stable relationship at the time. For Susan, she couldn't have hoped for a better profile for a neighbor, and she quickly built up a good relationship with Dyer and his then-girlfriend. Being next-door neighbors meant Susan and Dyer ran into each other and had conversations almost daily. However, their relationship wasn't just restricted to their daily chit-chat, and Dyer soon became a part of her small family. During an interview with local news, Susan had this to say about the former police officer. Ever since that day when they moved in, we talked on a daily basis. He and his girlfriend never had children, so they had adopted my kids, I guess. Unfortunately, the trusted relationship Susan developed with Dyer meant her nine-year-old daughter spent a lot of time over at his apartment, especially when Susan had to work. However, Susan's perfect little world was about to be thrown into complete disarray in a way that she could have never imagined in a million years. On one fateful evening in June 2013, Susan's daughter had gone to Dyer's apartment as per usual. It had gotten pretty late, so Susan decided to go over there to bring her home. You can call it a mother's instinct, but for some reason, Susan decided not to knock on Dyer's apartment door, and instead, she walked in quietly. Inside, the apartment felt eerily awkward, and the fact that her daughter was nowhere in sight when she walked in quickly aroused suspicions from Susan. The concerned mother was drawn to Dyer's room by some faint sound, and when she peeped through a crack in the door, what she saw nearly made her lose her footing. She saw Dyer sexually assaulting her nine-year-old daughter. While recounting the sordid experience, Susan said, I slammed the door open, grabbed her, and went back up to our apartment. I asked her if what I saw he was really doing. She said yes. As expected, Susan called 911 immediately, and Dyer was arrested for his despicable crimes. Susan's daughter later confirmed to detectives that it was the third time the disgraced police officer would be doing that to her. In December 2013, Dyer was convicted of first-degree criminal sexual assault against a minor. The judge went ahead to impose a 25 to 50-year sentence on him, and given the fact that he was a sexagenarian, it was more likely that Dyer would die in prison. In a perhaps sick twist to his story, Dyer's life came to a tragic end in prison sooner than anyone could have envisaged. The former cop began his sentence in January 2014 at the Saginaw Correctional Facility. It is a known fact that most convicted former police officers are often greeted with hostility by their fellow prisoners. However, the nature of Dyer's crime made him an easy target for the prisoners who were disgusted by his act of criminality. Even though the Saginaw Correctional Facility held some of the most notorious criminals in Michigan, including killers, sexually assaulting a nine-year-old girl was seen as a taboo by the generality of the inmates. Unfortunately for Dyer, this was a view shared by his cellmate, Stephen Sanderson, a man who was serving a life sentence without parole for murdering his girl friend in Wayne County in 1991. On October 29, 2014, 10 months into Dyer's prison sentence, his cellmate Sanderson snapped and killed the former police officer while they were inside their cell. It didn't take long for the news of Dyer's death to make it to the local news, and one of the people who was somewhat pleased by Dyer's sad ending was none other than the nine-year-old victim's mother. Although Susan claimed she never wanted to see anyone die, she couldn't help being happy for her daughter. In her words, so I think it was a relief for her, knowing that this wasn't going to happen again. Following a brief investigation by the Michigan State Police, Sanderson confessed to detectives that he killed Dyer and was officially charged with the murder. On February 23, 2015, Sanderson appeared before Chief Circuit Judge Fred L. Borchard in a Saginaw County Circuit Court, where he pleaded guilty to second-degree murder to a convict in prison. Inside the court, Sanderson was a picture of calm and showed no remorse for taking Dyer's life. When asked by his attorney, James Gust, if he had killed Theodore Dyer, Stephen Sanderson answered, Answered affirmatively. He said, Oh, sure. And you intended to kill. Oh, sure. Yes. 
Later, during the hearing, the judge asked Sanderson to tell the court how he had killed Theodore Dyer. The convicted killer then politely explained to the judge the chain of events that led up to Dyer's gruesome murder. Sanderson couldn't hide his disdain for Dyer, as he said he found out that the disgraced police officer was in prison for a really bad case of child rape. Sanderson went on to detail how Dyer had irked him on that fateful night by trying to justify why he sexually assaulted a little girl. However, when Dyer wouldn't shut up, he killed him. Sanderson said, I killed him. When I knocked I hit him and knocked him out, and then I took the shoelaces out of his shoes, tied them together, wrapped it around his neck, and strangled him. After I was done, I mean, I was, I was aware of what I was doing, you know. Although Sanderson continued to maintain that he had no regrets for taking Dyer's life, he distanced himself from the hero worship coming from a section of people who felt Dyer didn't deserve to live after raping a child. While affirming that he wasn't some kind of hero, during his April 22, 2015 sentencing, Sanderson also dropped some parting words for those who had criticized his actions in the months leading up to that moment. And I want to make it quite clear that I didn't judge him. You know, I know God is the only judge we have. I've just set the appointment up, so I don't feel bad for what I did, you know? Although Sanderson once again reiterated that he didn't feel bad about killing Dyer, he did show sympathy for his victim's family. He said, I don't feel bad for what I did. I feel bad for maybe his family or something. But as far as remorse toward him, no. Some of Dyer's family members were present at the court and listened to all that Sanderson had to say. However, they declined to speak in the court, and they also declined to speak to Saginaw News following the sentencing. Judge Fred L. Borchard imposed the maximum sentence of life imprisonment with the possibility of parole on Stephen and Sanderson. The convicted killer, who now had to serve two life sentences, was moved to a higher custody setting by the Michigan Department of Corrections personnel. Consequently, he is now serving his two life sentences at the Ionia Correctional Facility at the highest security level. Gerard John Schaefer. Well, if you thought Theodore Dyer was a despicable criminal cop, you might just be left pulling your hair and biting your fingernails after you go through the intriguing story of Gerard John Schaefer. Unlike Dyer, Schaefer was a predatory, serial killer who loved to prey on teenage girls and young women. Schaefer, who is also known as the hangman, the killer cop, and the butcher of Blind Creek, was convicted of the 1972 murder and mutilation of two teenage girls in Port St. Lucie, Florida. He is believed to be responsible for the deaths of up to 26 other female victims. Schaefer was dubbed the killer cop because he was a sheriff's deputy in Martin County, Florida, when he was initially arrested in 1972. He also became known as the hangman due to his disturbing practice of binding his female captives to trees and tying a hangman's noose around their neck before torturing and killing them. Sadistically, Schaefer's wickedness didn't end with the death of his victims as he usually carried out various unholy acts on their corpses, including dismembering body parts, cannibalism, and necrophilia. As unbelievable as it sounds, all of this happened, and while the details of Schaefer's killing spree are very sketchy, the killer cop's reign of terror around Florida is believed to have lasted for over half a decade. However, the drama and media uproar that ensued following his arrest lasted a lot longer and led to many more bumbling revelations that shook the entire nation. But what exactly makes a police officer become a depraved, sex-crazed serial killer? Gerard John Schaefer's problematic childhood provides something of a clue to what could have led him down such a dark, horrifying path. Schaefer was born in Nina, Wisconsin on March March 24, 1946, the oldest of three children. Gerard John Schaefer's father was a traveling salesman, while his mother was a housewife. Due to the nature of his father's work, Schaefer's childhood saw him grow up in different states, including Nashville, Tennessee, and then Atlanta, Georgia, before the family permanently relocated to Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 1960. Despite being the first son, Schaefer never enjoyed a good relationship with his father. He felt his father was hypercritical and preferred his little sister Sarah to him and his brothers. Perhaps in a bid to feel better about himself, Schaefer began wearing women's clothing and underwear at the age of 12. He soon picked up masturbatory acts of self-bondage in which he would tie himself to a tree and hurt himself in several ways. Schaefer later told a psychiatrist that he developed violent self-loathing while playing some of these childhood games. In his words, I always got killed in the games. I wanted to die. My father favored my sister, so I wanted to be a girl. I was such a disappointment to my family as a kid, to my father. He loved my sister. I couldn't 
please my father, so in playing games I wanted to be killed. As Schaefer grew older, self-harm wasn't enough to quiet his sexual urges, and he soon began fantasizing about hurting others, women in particular. In fact, during his time in a Florida high school, a young Schaefer confessed to his writing professor, semi-famous Southern novelist Harry Cruz, that he was haunted by murder fantasies. Disturbed by the then-teenager's confessions, Cruz referred Schaefer to a therapist. While speaking to the therapist, the young Schaefer made even more startling revelations. He confessed, would like to kill things. I even like to shoot at cows now. He also claimed that he had decapitated animals with a machete before going on to sodomize them. Several years later, Schaefer's fantasies manifested in reality when he recorded his first official victims as a deputy with the Martin County Sheriff's Department in 1972. A few months earlier, Schaefer was fired from his job as a police patrolman with the Wilton Manors Police Department after his superiors discovered he deliberately pulled over female motorists for minor traffic offenses, entered their license plates into a database to obtain more personal details before contacting them later to ask them on dates. Schaefer was also fired from a teaching position in 1969 for totally inappropriate behavior. Despite Schaefer's dismissal from the Wilton Manors Police Department, he was able to get another law enforcement job after forging a letter of recommendation from Wilton Manors endorsing his application. Schaefer proved too smart for the system and hence placed himself in a position where he could exploit the trust put in law enforcement agents to satisfy his evil sexual fantasies to the fullest. On the morning of July 22, 1972, Schaefer abducted two teenage hitchhikers, Nancy Ellen Trotter, 18, and Paula Sue Wells, 17, whom he had met the previous day. The infamous killer cop and took them to a wooded area where he tied them to separate trees and had their necks fastened to a noose. He went on to inform the girls that he would rape and kill them or even sell them into prostitution. Luckily for the ladies, Schaefer got an urgent call from the dispatch telling him to report to the police station. Schaefer hurriedly left the girls in the woods, but not before he warned them not to make any attempts to escape. Knowing that they faced certain death as he had promised them, the two girls managed to struggle free and made their way to the nearest police station, which happened to be Schaefer's precinct. While the girls were narrating their terrifying ordeal at the station, Schaefer arrived in the woods and discovered that the girls had escaped. Realizing that he had seriously goofed, he quickly returned home and called the station to inform Sheriff Robert Crowder that he had done something foolish. Schaefer proceeded to make a wild attempt at changing the narrative by creating a false story that he was trying to scare the girls and show them the dangers of hitchhiking. Given how far he had gone with his supposed demonstration, it was hard to believe his story. He was subsequently dismissed from the police force and taken into custody. Crowder then instructed his officers to file charges of false imprisonment and assault against him. He was released approximately two weeks later after he posted a $15,000 bail. One would think that almost getting caught, along with the fact that he was scheduled for trial in November 1972, would have convinced him to turn a new leaf. But like most serial killers, Schaefer just couldn't stop. After laying low for a few months, Schaefer struck again, and this time he did so with more precision. On September 27, 1972, he abducted and killed two teenage friends, Susan Carroll Place, 17, and Georgia Marie Jessup, 16. Similar to his previous foiled kidnapping attempt, Schaefer bound Place and Jessup up to a tree, tortured them, shot them through the mouth, and hacked them to death. He then proceeded to bury their remains on Hutchinson Island. However, during an interview while he was in prison, Schaefer denied assaulting the girls, claiming he just wanted to scare them. I tied them to the tree, but uh, I didn't go and get anybody and sell them. I just wanted to give them a scare. And of course, that was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. The next couple of months saw Schaefer go on a killing spree, taking the lives of several young women in a similar style. As usual, most of the victims were teenage girls, and they had gone missing while Schaefer waited for the commencement of his sentencing. They had been tied to trees, sexually assaulted, and beaten to death, with their remains buried in shallow makeshift graves. In December 1972, Schaefer agreed to a plea deal for one count of aggravated assault that saw him bag a one-year jail sentence with the possibility of parole after six months. Unbeknownst to Schaefer, he was never going to regain his freedom. Barely four months into his sentencing, the remains of Susan Place and Georgia Jessup were found by a father and son who were picking discarded aluminum cans in a wooded area in Oak Hammock Park, Port St. Lucie, Florida. Forensic evaluation of the badly decomposed remains gave details about the terrible suffering they had endured at the hands of their killer. Even after their deaths, Schaefer continued with his despicable crimes by decapitating the bodies and keeping some of their body parts as mementos. 
Quite interestingly, the gravesite was only six miles away from where Schaefer had held place in Jessup in July of the previous year. This tiny piece of information, as well as the many similarities in the method of abduction and murder of the two girls to Schaefer's earlier failed kidnapping of Trotter and Wells, led the police to obtain a search warrant for his home, vehicle, and his mother's house. When police searched Schaefer's mother's house, they found a ton of evidence, especially in his bedroom. Some of the things found in the house include personal mementos, an address book, a gold tooth, and clothing belonging to other confirmed murder victims and women who had been declared missing in the area. In the house, police also discovered teeth and sections of bone that were later traced to at least eight more victims. Still, the most shocking discovery from the house was the 300 pages of crude murder stories that Gerard John Schaefer had both typed and handwritten over the years. The stories detailed the rape, torture, and murder of several women, and were later used by the prosecution to show the jury the devious mind of a serial killer who took delight in inflicting immense pain on his victims. Back in Schaefer's home, which he shared with his then-wife, Teresa Dean, police found a distinctive suede purse belonging to Jessup in Dean's possession. Schaefer's wife later confirmed that he had gifted her the bag in November of the previous year. However, he had called her from prison shortly after the bodies of the two girls were discovered and desperately tried to persuade her to discard the bag. In October 1973, Gerard John Schaefer was officially charged with the murders of Susan Place and Georgia Jessup. Despite the mountain of evidence against him, Schaefer bullishly maintained his innocence throughout the trial, but his little act wasn't fooling anyone. He was eventually convicted for both murders and given two life sentences. Although he was never tried for his other crimes, the discoveries from the search of his home led to more speculative hyperbole, as well as various conflicting reports about how many women he actually killed during his senseless killing spree. The police on their path were convinced that Schaefer's handwritten stories were not just fantasies as the convicted killer had claimed, and they fed local media with the idea that he was probably responsible for over 30 murders. Putting it succinctly, Dave Kelly, one of the detectives who extensively interrogated Schaefer about his crimes, described the killer cop as a sexual psychopath. He also said, I strongly believe Schaefer was responsible for a lot more crimes than he was confined for. 1968 is the date of the first crime they attribute to him, but I believe he probably started his activities in his early teen years, probably 12 to 14. And I'm talking murder, not just his sexual activities. Despite being condemned to a lifetime behind bars, Schaefer reveled in the media circus created by his case. Although he continued to aggressively argue his innocence, he went on to publish two books, Killer Fiction and Beyond Killer Fiction, with the help of an ex-girlfriend, Sandra London. Many believed the books were true accounts of his gruesome killings, but Schaefer remained adamant that they were mere fiction. However, he would regularly brag about killing several women in his jailhouse letters to London, and even described himself as one of the top serial killers of this century in one of those letters. Schaefer and London would later fall out in spectacular fashion after the latter described him as a serial killer while speaking to a reporter. Angered by her remarks, Schaefer tried to sue her and also threatened to send some of his criminal friends on the outside after her. However, he failed with both threats and London was able to obtain a protective order against him. Away from all the drama going on outside, Schaefer found life inside prison very cold and allegedly snitched on some of the inmates to obtain favors from the authorities. After serving 22 years of his life sentence, Schaefer, who was 49 at the time, was found stabbed to death in his cell on December 3, 1995. A convicted murderer named Vincent Faustino Rivera was charged with the violent killing, which saw him slit Schaefer's throat before proceeding to stab him 42 times on the face, head, neck, and body. While Rivera never gave any motive for this act, it is believed that it was payback for snitching on a powerful inmate. It is hard to overlook the fact that not many people liked him in the prison, including the guards. In the year leading up to his death, he suffered many attacks from fellow convicts who threw feces at him and even set his cell on fire on two occasions. Several reactions trailed the news of Gerard John Schaefer's death, but the response of Judge Cyrus Trowbridge, who presided over Schaefer's trial, best summarizes the general feeling of everyone connected to the case. While speaking on Schaefer's death, Trowbridge said, he's finally gotten the death sentence he ultimately deserved, but couldn't be given. Flores Valdo de Oliveira. While Gerard John Schaefer was a loner, motivated by his evil lusts and desires, Brazilian Flores Valdo de Oliveira assembled a power-drunk death squad that wreaked havoc in the outskirts of Sao Paulo, purely out of greed. The group operated like bloodthirsty bandits, killing dozens of people and extorting merchants along the outskirts of Brazil's largest city in a reign of terror that spanned between 1982 and 1983. The 80s was characterized by a heightened crime wave in America, but this can hardly be compared to what was happening in Brazil 
Brazil, which was more like a war zone at the time. From a repressive military dictatorship that lasted more than two decades to gang violence and a crooked police force, large parts of the country were a cesspool of crime and everything unholy. Unsurprisingly, the chaos gave rise to a lot of criminals and gang leaders who perpetrated the most heinous crimes, but none of them were quite like Flores Valdo de Oliveira. Born in Uchoa, Brazil on November 18, 1958, Oliveira was widely known as Cabo Bruno, a name that had stuck from his childhood in Catanduva after his friends teased him by comparing him to a local drunk called Bruno. The young Oliveira found it so hard to drop the name that even his mother began to call him Cabo Bruno at some point. In those times, most of the boys from the low-income areas in Brazil saw only two ways out of their poverty, either joining the criminal gangs or signing up with the police force. However, at the time, the police were deeply involved with criminal organizations and death squads, and the only way one could differentiate between the two was only through their id uniforms. Cabo Bruno ultimately joined the military police of Sao Paulo State, but his thirst for power led him down a dark path, and he eventually became a vigilante serial killer who dispatched many to the afterlife on a whim. According to several victim accounts, some of Cabo Bruno's executions were solely motivated by the victim's appearance. These claims were further corroborated by the police after his capture, with one particular incident reported where Cabo Bruno had killed a boy because of a small cross tattooed to his wrist. For Cabo Bruno, any kind of tattoos pointed at some sort of criminality, and as the judge and jury, he could execute such persons at will. However, like all corrupt police officers, Cabo Bruno had other motivations, and money dominated all of them. Operating strictly during his spare time, Cabo Bruno assembled a death squad that mostly targeted traders in the district of Jabaquara. The group opened fire on unarmed civilians like crazed maniacs while also extorting the traders, who had no choice but to part with their money in a bid to save their lives. Most of the killings that Cabo Bruno was eventually charged with took place in 1982, an unprecedented period characterized by bullet-ridden bodies littering the streets and causing panic amongst the locals almost daily. Despite the brazen nature of his crimes, Cabo Bruno still took some steps to evade arrest. For his operations, he was known to use three types of cars, a Chevrolet Impala, Ford Maverick, and a Chevrolet Chevette, whose colors were always changed. While this helped him to spring the element of surprise for nearly every raid, it also gained him some popularity. More importantly, Cabo Bruno and his gang of vigilantes were connected to high-ranking officials whose influence influence afforded them some protection, which allowed their operations to go unchecked throughout 1982. However, the criminal enterprise headed by Cabo Bruno came crumbling down after one of his victims, Jose Aparecido Benedito, survived. Although Benedito was shot by Cabo Bruno, he pretended to be dead and later escaped after the assailants had left the crime scene. Despite his bullet wounds, he was able to make it to the police to report the incident and positively ID Cabo Bruno as the ringleader of the group. This led to a widespread investigation by the police that later uncovered that Cabo Bruno's gang was made up of at least 12 police officers, including two high-ranking officials, a captain and a lieutenant. Cabo Bruno é apontado como líder do Esquadrão da Morte, acusado de fazer justiça com as próprias mãos. Ele foi detido pela primeira vez em 1983 e, após três fugas, foi preso em definitivo em 1992. Na semana passada, o acusado entrou com um pedido de perdão para que seja extinta toda a condenação. Em setembro de 1983, Cabo Bruno foi arrestado pela primeira vez por ordem de corte, depois que ele foi acusado de matar mais de 20 pessoas. Essas acusações foram Backed by several witnesses who claimed they had seen him commit these murders. Even though Cabo Bruno only admitted to one murder, the case against him was watertight, as the witness testimonies, alongside several credible pieces of evidence, proved too much for his defense. After 12 trials, he was eventually sentenced to 113 years imprisonment. Cabo Bruno's notoriety continued in prison, with the convicted serial killer escaping from jail on three separate occasions. Following his third escape attempt on May 30, 1991, he was moved to the Jose Augusto Cesar Salgado Penitentiary in Tremembe. At some point during his time in jail, Cabo Bruno embraced Christianity and began to adjust to life behind bars. He later became an evangelical and denounced the name Bruno, which he believed was tainted with the criminality of a life he was eager to leave behind. The former police officer also took to art during his time in prison, and in 1998, an exhibition featuring several of his artworks was held in Sao Paulo. Ten years later, Cabo Bruno completed his incredible turnaround when he married a 
housewife who did volunteer work at the prison. At the time, he was a pastor in the prison chapel. As part of his newly found lease of life, Cabo Bruno changed his initial stance during his trial and admitted to killing 20 people. He further claimed other people had committed murders while camouflaging as Cabo Bruno, which would explain the police's insistence that he had killed over 50 people. The next part of Cabo Bruno's story can only be explained by the Bible's teaching about how a man who finds Christ has become new and how old things pass away. For many people, it certainly felt like Cabo Bruno had somehow managed to trade his old life for a new one when the Taubate court granted him his freedom on August 22, 2012, after serving less than 30 years of his sentence. The court cited good behavior and the fact that he had served over 20 years in prison as the reason for the controversial judgment. Bruno was overjoyed by the ruling and joked about how he would have to carry a copy of his original release license with him to show the police so they wouldn't think he had escaped again. However, that joy was short-lived as he was murdered barely a month later while driving with his family in the neighborhood Quadra Coberta in Pindamon Hungaba on September 26, 2012. On his way back from a church service in the municipality of Aparecida, he was accosted by two men who opened fire on the vehicle, leaving Cabo Bruno's body riddled with bullets. The two men only shot at him, and none of his relatives were harmed in the vicious attack. The former police officer was pronounced dead on the scene, and police claimed all evidence points to an execution. According to Lieutenant Mario Tonin of the military police, all the signs seem to indicate that it was an extrajudicial killing, but we will only find out after the police investigation. The two men were able to escape on foot and were never found despite the police launching a wide-scale manhunt for them. Following Cabo Bruno's death, his family auctioned off several of his paintings and used the proceeds to restart their life somewhere else. Nothing has been heard about Cabo Bruno's family in the years that have followed, thereby bringing an ignominious end to the man who nearly got away with it. For more content like this, click on the videos showing on your screen now.